After reports surfaced that the White House refused to send assistance during the terrorist attack in Libya that killed four Americans, a group of Navy SEALs decided to fire back on a PAC, a Navy SEAL PAC, on Facebook. But this post, critical of President Obama, was quickly scrubbed, taken off by the site's censors. What happened to freedom of speech? Joining us right now is Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano. Judge, while a lot of people like to think of uh, Facebook as, uh, you know, just this giant, all knowing, all seeing, all fair institution, it's not. It's owned by stockholders and right. people and they can do any darn oh, thing we, they want. We know it's owned by stockholders, plenty of whom lost a lot of money a few months ago, but it is a private corporation. By private I mean it's not owned by the government. Uh, as Peter knows and as many people watching us probably know, the First Amendment only restrains the government. Mm -hmm. So as uh, as distasteful as this is for them to to kick people off their platform because they disagree with the message, the political message, they can do so. Uh, however, there's there's a there's a dark, there's a, a bright side to this story, and that is there was an overwhelming uh, response, negative response to Facebook when they kicked That's this right. uh, ad from the or this statement from the seals off, and that statement is now back on. This also demonstrates what a lot of us have been talking about for the past few weeks. The mainstream media is intentionally avoiding this story, and it's of profound interest to the American public because it goes to the heart of the government. When is the government lying? When is the government telling you the truth? When is the government saving lives? When is the government not doing its job? Okay, Facebook had a statement. Maybe you can help us figure out what it means. <laughs> this was an error, and we apologize for any inconvenience it may have caused. Our dedicated team reviews millions of pieces of content today, and occasionally we block content we shouldn't have. So now they're saying it was a mistake to block it. No, I honestly don't know if that's a serious statement, if they're trying to cover up for an institutional decision, or if some rogue censor who with likes... With a political the, point of view. Correct, with a political point of view and, and an agenda, decided to kick this off to right. see what would happen. Because why does Facebook really care? I mean, they, they have so many subscribers. Yes. Do you think it could really backlash on them? Uh, they're, they're so huge that I don't know that this, that this would backlash. That's if why this, I'm surprised by if that If this statement. were persistent, if Facebook took down all postings from all Fox News uh, viewers, I would mm -hmm. think that another Facebook would come into uh, existence and compete with them. Sure. And that's the last thing uh, that they want. Ultimately, though, because they took it down, this is blown up in their face. Absolutely. And more people know about it now than they did before. Absolutely, because we're all uh, talking about it, notwithstanding uh, the mainstream media avoiding it. Maybe it'll change their behavior in the future. Maybe it should. Maybe it'll even influence a few votes next week. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Judge, thank you very much for seeing us. Thank you. 21 minutes, actually uh, 19 minutes before the hour now on Studio B and live pictures from the Rockaways, uh, uh, far reaches of Queens, New York. And it's just a carbon copy of what we've seen up and down the Jer Jersey Shore, along the Connecticut Shore, on the South Shore of Long Island, on the North Shore of Long Island, uh, up into other parts of New England, down the coast in Maryland. It's just... It's just awful. I mean, it starts to look like the same old thing there at home, doesn't it? It's like, oh, there they go again. But every time, it's another 400,000 people, another 500,000 people whose lives are in complete disarray. You cannot get gas for your car. You do not have electricity at your house. Your kids do not go to school. You can't get to work. There's not any food in the house. There's not any food at the supermarket. You can't get to the supermarket because there's no gas in the car. The kids are getting sick. It's going to be in the 30s tonight. And winter is here in the Northeast. It, it, we have three days of fall every year, and they were beautiful. And now it's winter. And now there's sand everywhere, and there's no gas and no food and no water and no electricity, and it's awful. And it's happening now. This morning, there were 4.7 million Americans with no power because of this storm. Seconds ago, we got an alert from the Energy Department of Energy. Now it's 4.5 million. So 200,000 people have had the lights turned on today. At this pace, everything will be fine by the new year. There's word some businesses are trying to profit off the tragedy, as happens every storm. New Jersey officials say investigators are looking to around 100 complaints of price gouging at gas stations and hotels and other stores that sell necessities to storm victims. The judge is in the house, Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano. After Hurricane Andrew, they did this in Andrew back in 92, and people went crazy, and they prosecuted people, and they put them in jail for it.
Well, most states don't prosecute. I'm, 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 I'm familiar with the cases not about which you're them. speaking. But, yeah. you... but, but they're very heavy with respect to fines. And yeah. these are not fines imposed after a trial. These are fines imposed by an inspector on the spot. And it's difficult to challenge the discretion exercised by the inspector. I'll give you an example. Some of these fines are serious. Uh, at a gas station in Branchville, New Jersey, which is not far from where I live, in the northwest corner of, of New Jersey, a gas station was fined $50,000 for raising the price of gas more than 10% for a day. Now, the guy couldn't pay the $50,000, so the state took over the gas station. The state didn't know what to do with the gas station, so they sold it back to the oil company, and the oil company sold it to somebody else. Uh. That's a very, very, very stiff fine, which probably didn't have the consequence that the state intended. But Governor Christie is uh, serious and has dispatched a lot of inspectors to make sure this doesn't happen. And, and gas seems to be the issue. I know you talked about batteries and other things. Uh, most states allow you to raise the price up to 10%, mm -hmm. and they allow you to raise it above 10% from where it was before the, uh, the tragedy if your suppliers have raised it. So, for example, we saw some cases in New York City this morning where um, restaurants and bodegas were charging $3 for a cup of coffee. Well, that's because they had to use bottled water because they didn't have any water. If that's the real cost of the cup of coffee plus a little bit of profit for them, even though that sounds like a lot of money for a cup of coffee that's normally a dollar, that's acceptable. So it's not, it's not always clear and it's not always black and white, but you don't get a trial on this. Yeah. If you want to appeal the imposition of the fine, you have to go to an appeals court. You don't get a jury. Well, I... Hey, remember the hanging Chad thing and the pregnant Chad and stuff like that? It was a messy election down in Florida. We've had messy elections before, but Judge Napolitano says just wait. And now it is easier than ever for members of both parties to challenge the results. And he joins us live. Good morning to you, Judge. Good morning, guys. One of the reasons it's easier than ever is because since Bush versus Gore, in 2000, when your humble colleague had to become an expert at hanging chads I remember. And, and chads with dimples. In dimples, yeah. Right, we remember those days. Uh, the legal community has developed expertise in election law. Now, even though this looks like it's a national election, it's really 51, the 50 states plus the District of Columbia. It's 51 state elections with 51 different sets of law. So in every state and in the District of Columbia, there are l lawyers who are experts on election law for Democrats and for Republicans. And these people have found ingenious ways to challenge things. So no matter how well it's going, mm -hmm. no matter how smoothly it looks, whoever is losing has an opportunity to make a challenge. The Democrats will say Republican poll workers wouldn't let uh, people who are authorized to vote vote. Right. And Republicans will say Democrats are voting twice. They also have people voting who aren't authorized to vote. And the courts are not going to be able to resolve this on Tuesday night. So right. if you have a presence there, if you're a Republican, if you're Romney or Obama people, Republican or Democrat, the best thing you could do is have a presence there to show, maybe intimidate people to playing it straight, correct? Well, intimidation is actually... Not intimidate, just go, oh, that guy's over here. I'm probably... watching. Yeah. Well, you're allowed you to have poll not. watchers. Mo most states permit each party to have three poll watchers, if they can get the manpower, mm -hmm. at each individual polling place. And those poll watchers can say, this guy killed me. I think he voted in Massapequa. I also think he voted in Hempstead. I'm just using you as an example, of course. Uh, and if they do, then there'll be some inquiry and some, uh, and some checking uh, of the records. The, the only way there won't be all this litigation if, is if one of them wins by substantial numbers in right. given states. So if it's close, just count on legions of lawyers. Correct. All right. All right. Great. Cheery news. You think I'm going to be busy? <laughs> I, I think, think so. <laughs> I, think, I think it's going overtime. We're going to scramble you up at uh, 4 o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, I'll be here all night. Wednesday morning. That's right. Uh, and these right. are poll watchers, not dancers. Exactly right. <laughs> Tell me what's on your mind at this hour. Never mind. Never mind. Every side it's of the been story. a long campaign. Yeah. So let's take this to the judge. Why don't we? Fox News senior judicial analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano, in set on this last full day of campaigning. I, I was reading the briefings every day. The judge gives briefings to us about what his thoughts are on things, and it was a reminder: we're not having one big national election. That's not what we do. We're having 51 individual elections in 51 different areas, and in each place, you're fighting for the electoral votes from that one spot. In California, it's 55. Somewhere else, it's three, but it's 51 different contests. That's 51 different sets of lawyers. I right. You know, Shep, when uh, you and I together covered the uh, recount in uh, right. Florida in November of 2000, about which we could both tell a lot of stories, you could fit around this table at which you and I are sitting 
the people, the lawyers who specialize professionally in election work. Mm -hmm. Now you could fit them in a small college basketball arena. There are thousands of them, <laughs> and they have been researching and preparing and just itching to go. So to some extent, litigation that will commence at midnight on Tuesday night might actually be lawyer-driven. But it will only happen if any of these states are so close or if the controversies are of such a magnitude that the litigation, the lawsuits, could actually change the outcome. If Governor Romney or President Obama wins in a given state by a significant number, then even if there are disputes, you're not going to see litigation about it. Now, you're suggesting that in some cases, the, not the campaigns, but the lawyers themselves may generate the litigation. Yes, I think they will persuade the campaigns that their unique knowledge of a very, very narrow and bizarre area of law, which didn't exist when I was in law school, yeah. now called election law, which all came about, or much of it came about since Bush versus Gore in 2000. They will persuade the campaigns in certain key states, we can get you this many votes, we can disqualify that many votes. Now, if the this or the that are greater than the difference between the president and the governor, the loser might go for it. But if the this or the that is smaller than the difference, then they're not going to go for it. And we may know before we w wake up on Wednesday who, who has won. In a lot of places, this may come down to they wouldn't let enough people vote. We wanted to vote past midnight. You can't do that. No. The, the courts can start voting early. So, for example, when a Florida judge permitted voting after midnight on Saturday by letting the vote... Early in, voting. Correct. That is permissible. But under federal law, no judge can permit votes to be cast after midnight Tuesday night. That cannot be changed by a judge. Only changing the Constitution or an act of Congress uh, could change that. Now, now that, that's not to say if you're in line at midnight and you haven't voted yet that they won't let you. You just have to be in line. Correct. If you're in line by the time the polls close, they won't let anybody else in line, but they have to let you vote. But they have to stop collecting votes and start uh, counting votes at midnight, according to federal law. We may know a lot. It, depending on what happens in Virginia and New Hampshire in the early going, it's possible, I wouldn't count on it, but it's possible that we may not need to get to Ohio. I think you're right. Uh, if Governor Romney takes both places or if the president takes both places, I think those will be good indicators of which way the election is going. And then you'll see all these lawyers that are ready, raring to go, stand down. Mm. All right, Judge. Thank you, sir. Pleasure, my friend. See you Tuesday night. Uh, tomorrow night. It's hard to believe. Finally, it's tomorrow. Finally, oh. this is over with. <laughs> Ooh. Trace Gallagher live in the West Coast News Hub tonight. Some, some states are also tackling the health care law. Yeah, Shep, there are four states tomorrow that will vote whether to opt out of health care reform, better known as Obamacare. Those four states are Alabama, Florida, Montana, and Wyoming. And all four states are asking their voters to reject being forced to buy health insurance. But these measures went on the ballot before the Supreme Court ruled that Obamacare was constitutional. So, however, the votes turn out in the states it would mean the feds would likely still trump the states. Listen. If uh, Governor Romney is elected president, this will be a sort of a, a push behind him uh, to uh, invalidate most of Obamacare. If the president is reelected, this will be a, a force, a numerical force that he'll have to contend with as he tries to implement Obamacare. So to that extent, these numbers could be helpful, but they're not going to change the law. Yeah, the law will stay the same, but at the very least, we'll have a much better idea in those four states of exactly what those residents think about the health care reform law. As you know, Brian, polls are open right now, and Americans are split, nearly 50-50, on which candidate they want to be the next president. One focused on growing the government, arguably, and the other determined to shrink it. Joining me now to explain how, Fox News senior judicial analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano. Okay, so what's your overarching way of analysis in which you look at the differences between these two candidates? In the, in the, in the area of the economy, which is most important to most Americans, the president wants to use the government to redistribute wealth. Governor Romney wants to take the government out of the way of private enterprise. The Governor Romney understands basic economics 101, which is risk 
and private enterprise produces prosperity, wealth, and jobs, and everybody's better off for it. The president rejects that notion and believes that by taxing a certain class of people and giving those tax dollars to others, they will have that money to spend. But that, of course, doesn't last and doesn't produce prosperity. It just puts a little bit more money in the pockets of those folks. So These are fundamental differences about the role of government in our lives. Exactly. So you have four areas that you want to explore this morning. The first is taxes. Uh, we have this fiscal cliff approaching. We do. We do. The fiscal cliff is in large measure uh, of the president's own making because of the president's inability to reach across the aisle and work with a Republican House and a Democratic Senate. So we now have laws that are going to automatically kick in and not spend dollars that members of Congress might want to spend or, on the other hand, spend dollars that the government doesn't have. Essentially, the president signed a law that takes the government out of the control of the Congress and puts it on automatic pilot and nobody's happy with the way that autopilot is going to go uh, in in January. Right. Stimulus programs. The president was in favor of that. Do you think he tried to do another one? In yes. The president believes these stimulus programs have helped. Essentially, he's taken tax dollars and given them to discrete groups of his friends, labor unions and corporate officials that like him, and enriched those people at the expense of the rest of us. And many of those investments the federal government made in those corporations, everybody remembers Solyndra, were an utter failure. There were corporations that private investment would never risk its own money in. Only the government risking other people's money would get cash into those coffers. Federal regulation. Well, the president is the king of, of federal regulation, and he has attempted to do by regulatory authority the Environmental Protection Administration comes to mind, for example, what Congress specifically has decided not to do. That makes him dangerous in a new term, because if he can't get the Congress to do something, he'll try and get an administrative agency that he has appointed to do it. Deficits. Well, they're both prepared to run deficits, but the president's will be wildly deeper and more extensive uh, than, than Governor Romney's if Governor Romney becomes president. President Obama borrowed $5 trillion in four years. That's more than any other president has done in eight years, and he's probably going to do the same if reelected. That would put us uh, on a path of destruction because we'd have a total government debt of $20 trillion. The interest on $20 trillion a year is $1 trillion. Down the drain, off the top, gone, taken from the American people. Interesting analysis, Judge Andrew Napolitano. Always good to see you. Gonna serious. We're very serious yes, today. Yes, we are very serious. Election I have day. to say something ridiculous. Did Kill me and fall asleep over on that couch? No, he was taking notes. Oh, all right. All right. <laughs> see you tomorrow. <laughs> Pleasure. Well, Tell me a long night, he, but I'll see you tomorrow. Okay, bleary eyed at best. Well, right now we're still hours away from the first results in the presidential race, but some looming legal battles we're watching, and they've been kind of cropping up uh, well ahead of Election Day, from Democrats in Florida suing to extend early voting to a potential dispute over provisional ballots in the battleground state of Ohio to voting machine irregularity as reported in North Carolina and Colorado, two very important states. Also, voters in New York and New Jersey hit hard by Hurricane Sandy, finding multiple obstacles in their way to voting and lawyers for both campaigns apparently are staying very busy with all this going on. Judge Andrew Napolitano is here. He's a Fox News a senior uh, Fox News judicial analyst. Judge, any of those things that we just mentioned raise a red flag that you think could present a, a big issue uh, this election time? Well, they all could present a big issue, uh, Jenna. I mean, people c were, could argue in New York and New Jersey where the outcome for the presidential election is probably not in dispute. We didn't get a chance to vote. 25 percent of us didn't get a chance to vote. So give us a chance to vote on Wednesday. The state is without authority to do that in the presidential election. They can let people vote on Wednesday for other candidates, but federal law requires that all voting for president be concluded before midnight local time everywhere in the United States. So period, underscore, underscore. That's correct. Right. The governors and the legislatures of the various states cannot change that. On the other hand, we had the incident that you um, addressed in the uh, introduction to the segment in Florida where lawyers sued the state of Florida to allow uh, the polls to stay open later on early voting days. Well, that is easily within the discretion of, of the states. If you permit early voting and you're about to close at 11 o'clock and there's 500 people in line, you should give them the right to vote. If, if it comes 8 o'clock tonight in New Jersey when the sure. polls close and there's 500 people in line and it goes out the door and around the block, those people get to vote, even though they might not get in the building until 9.30. But that's up for the state to say we're extending the hours until 11.59 Yes. Yeah. Yes. Just as, as 
as a judge watching elections, though it seems that every year we get some of these problems that crop up. Is this different? Do you, do you, hear, you think you hear more this time around, less? How does it compare? I'll tell you what's different this year is that there are now thousands of lawyers in the United States of America who are election law experts. Now, there was no such thing as an election law expert in 2000 when we had Bush versus Gore. Since then, law students are taught this in law school, and they become lawyers, and they become expert in the field. So remember, we have 51 separate elections tonight, the 50 states and the District of Columbia. It looks like it's a national election, but it's all these separate elections. In each one of these jurisdictions, there are Democratic lawyers and Republican lawyers champing at the bit to help bring about the outcome that their party wants by using the courts uh, to do so. But this can only happen if there's a, if there's a significant system-wide problem, if a large number of people are not permitted to vote, or if a large number of people vote more than once. Whichever the case may be, this could get into the hands of a judge. And then you have the issue of impoundment. When a judge says, you know what, like it's midnight. <laughs> yeah, it's midnight, and I don't feel like supervising the counting of these votes now. I'm going to lock them up until 8 in the morning. We'll resume the counting of them then. Just well, then the whole scenario. country is on pins and needles. One scenario. Okay, Judge, we'll watch for that. Did you vote yet already today? Uh, well, we had early voting for the first time in my lifetime in New Jersey. I voted on Saturday. Just making sure. And was happy to do so. Checking the box. Legally, of course, Judge. Of course, Got Jenna. my eye on you. All, all right. right. Jenna, you can have your eye on me all you want. Oh, yeah, you just stop. And vice versa. <laughs> Judge, thank you very much. You're John? Welcome. The demographics are changing. It's not a traditional America anymore. And there are 50% of the voting public who want stuff. They want things. And who is going to give them things? President Obama. There is uh, Bill O'Reilly on our election night coverage talking about how people want stuff. And on President Obama's watch, people got more stuff than ever. So between 2008 and 2011, federal welfare payments increased by 32 percent and food stamps usage surged by 71 percent. So did an entitlement explosion help the president lock up a second term? Joining us now is Fox News senior judicial analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano. There's been so much discussion, Judge, about this so-called so tipping point when you get to 50 percent of the population who is getting some sort of a government handout. Um, and, you know, I'm careful to use the entitlement word because some people, vets and such, and Social Security Understood. and Medicare, yeah. you know, but we're talking now about food stamps, welfare, right. et cetera. Right. We're, we're talking about a dangerous situation, which, interestingly enough, was predicted 200 years ago by uh, Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton, who said, and they rarely agreed on anything, but they agreed on this, when the public treasury becomes a public trough, their word, mm -hmm. and when the voters realize this, they will only send to the government people who will promise to bring back the bigger piece of the pie. And they never imagined that that number would reach 50%. When it reaches 50 and then goes over 50, we have a situation where the half that receives from, the, or the half plus one that receives from the trough, has the legal tools with which to fill the trough from the pocketbooks and bank accounts of the other half. More metaphors. So this, uh, <laughs> you would think, more trough talk for his okay. out here. You would think the cash cow would be treated like the golden goose and not touched because, after all, they're supplying the 50 percent who have been feeding at the trough. He is so smart. I thought you went to Stanford. Uh, you never know. <laughs> I rejected it because uh, did, the CW I... Post campus was nicer. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but judge, why would, why don't we covet those those breadwinners more? Why are we treating them so harshly and so be badly? Because uh, the people that can control these things right now the president know the short-term political gain that they can achieve like his re-election victory two nights ago uh, as a result of giving away cash now they don't see that every dollar they take away from taxpayers whether they make a million dollars or a billion dollars right. is a dollar less to invest in the economy and produce prosperity right. and jobs. They don't see the long-term effect of raising taxes, you which know, is less economic activity, not more. Sure, and absolutely. So what you're telling us is uh, this class warfare thing is going to go on for a long time. Yes. I'm also telling you, and I'm happy to say this, and you'll know why. O'Reilly is right. <laughs> he, he truly put, in my view, his finger on the entire meaning of the evening. Mm -hmm. The people who want stuff are now a statistical majority but, of voters in the country. But, it, but it's, diff, it's, it's also not just monetary. It's also a mindset. Would you agree with that? Yes, and I think that's the first part of Bill's statement when he said uh, the, the majority of the country no longer embraces the traditions that we were taught as children and that our parents and grandparents and ancestors uh, embraced. Things are changing right before our eyes. 
and uh, we need to be aware of what's happening. Yeah, the judge has written a great column on this topic. You can read the whole thing over at foxnews.com. Judge, thank you very much. For thank you, guys. Us. Have a good day. Let's take it to the judge. Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano, is here. Life on top of life on top of more of that. Well, you know, the, uh, uh, the penalty really was uh, determined at the time the government accepted his and the court accepted the, the, the guilty plea. So what went on today was really an effort by the court to, for lack of a better phrase, let the victims come to closure by giving them their say uh, to the face of the person that uh, committed these horrific crimes. Now, a lot of judges are not crazy about this because it's largely irrelevant to the proceedings because, as I said, there's no, there's no uh, room for discretion in imposing the sentence. He agreed to serve a life sentence for each one of the people uh, harmed, and that's the sentence that would be imposed no matter what these people said. But the courts have concluded that allowing them to say these things is better for everybody uh, involved, and that's why we go through it. In the occasional case, Shep, the a victim will say something to the judge that the judge didn't think about, didn't know of, or forgot about, and that might change the sentence, but that's not the case here, and it is indeed rare for that to happen. Wrapped in all of this was uh, some discussion of whether we pay enough attention to people's mental health and stability in cases like this. Well, as Dan just reported, I mean, the college that this kid attended knew that he had very, very serious uh, mental issues. Uh, look, if you or I have a next door neighbor that we think has mental issues, we don't have to do anything about it. But if we are a hospital or a healthcare professional or an administrator of a college where that person is, uh, is employed or works or is a student, we have an obligation to do something about it. And that school in Arizona didn't do anything. It doesn't mean if they did something this wouldn't have happened, but it, it might have prevented it. It might have called to the attention of law enforcement the danger that this guy poses. Jared Lee Lofner's parents uh, escorted out a side door. Our producers there tell us uh, they cried through the whole thing and, and frankly, to, to quote our producer, they just looked awful. Well, this Imagine is, this family. This is a killer for them uh, as well. They could never live with themselves knowing that this is, person is their son and he did these horrible things. You know, this is not a whodunit. There's no question but that what he, what he did and the horrific harm that he caused and how unexpected it was even to his parents. I dare say they've suffered as much as the family of the victims. Our producer in the courtroom tells us that Gabby Giffords and her husband, the astronaut Mark Kelly, hugged for an entire minute when this proceeding had finished, said something quiet to each other, and that was that. And they say, this happy couple say, they will not think of or discuss the killer in this case ever again.